Hi everyone, it's Dawn here, and um, today I want to talk about um, how to write an EUC. <laughs> so this has been a topic that everyone's been asking me to make um, for a while, and I keep not doing it because I don't feel I don't feel like I can write an EUC. So I've only been written can't talk today. Um, I've only been writing for a little bit over a year now, and I yeah I don't feel like I can write. So, um, but people keep asking me for this, so I'm putting together this very bizarre way of uh, how to write an EUC um, according to me. There are so many other videos on how to write an EUC for beginners, and I think that they probably do the job just fine. Um, I, I have some weird things of my own, so I'll go into those though. Uh, all right, so selecting your first EUC, I would say maybe not an M103, M104. Those smaller ones are almost in a category of their own. They are um, kind of squiggly and squirrely for an adult person. Maybe for children, um, it can work just fine. It's just that they're so small in relation to you. You don't, you can't really put your legs on it and hold it that way and stuff like that. And they are squirrely uh, for adults. So. Um, you know, the kid is smaller, so then the wheel is, the proportion is better. The wheel size to child height sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, if you're a child, M103, M104 is probably great. Um, if you're an adult, maybe something a little bit bigger would be easier because then you, you have something a little more substantial for you to grab onto. And a lot of people, they don't want to get a smaller wheel like that to learn on because they think that it's going to be a waste. I was definitely in that um, train of thought as well. That's why I learned on an RS19HT high torque um, because I didn't want to get a smaller wheel and just have to outgrow it and then have to buy another one, right? I just wanted one wheel that I could live forever with. That was going to be my RS and now my RS is the only one that I've sold so far and he did sell. Um, but he sold because he's in the middle category, okay? So I, in my stable now, I like to have my small wheels and then my MCM5, which I still considered a smaller wheel. The smaller wheels definitely have a place in your stable because it's so much easier to grab those quick trips. Um, put it in your trunk of your car, take it out, quick little trips around, da 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 It's so easy and like pick it up with one hand, you know, and, and it's easy to tuck away here and there. So definitely small wheels. You, you can keep them and, uh, in your stable just fine and they're valuable. So choosing one of those to learn with is, I think, perfect. A lot of people want to jump straight to a V13 or a Monster Pro that is just going to be a little bit trickier because it's such a heavy wheel and when you're first starting your mu those little stabilizer muscles are the ones that you're going to be training and kicking in and those stabilizer muscles now have to get strong enough to handle you know the 120 pounds of a heavy wheel versus 40 or 20 30 40 pounds um, so it'll just be, you'll be able, your muscle strength, your stabilizer muscle strength is probably going to be able to, um, handle the 40 pounder quicker than the hundred pounder. <laughs> That's all. Um, also the more, the bigger ones are typically more expensive, um, and you, you know, any wheel that you're learning on, you might want to pad it all up. So it doesn't matter if it's ugly, just pad it up. Yoga mats, um, pads, you know, whatever, stick those baby bumpers all over it because it's going to be tipping over, falling over a lot, and you want to protect the wheel. Um, so my recommendation would be like anything in the MCM5 um, RS maybe range. Uh, but remember when... When I first started last year, a lot of people were even saying that a Sherman Max was too big to be a first wheel. And Sherman Maxes and Shermans have been 
the first wheel for lots of riders and it's just been fine so it's it's it can all be done it's just um you knowing the extra challenges of the extra weight or whatever and you know giving yourself extra time to build up those muscles those extra muscles i'm just gonna keep saying extra a lot um all right um so you got your wheel picked out for you gear up <laughs> i am not a gear nazi there's plenty of times you'll see me tooling around with no gear nothing at all and all that stuff so i'm not a gear nazi but when you're first learning this chances are likely that you're going to fall and might as well protect your head your wrists wrist guards definitely wrist guards you're going to be falling a lot on your hands and if you do that your wrists are very delicate and they can um, get really hurt very easily not a broken wrist just the strain and the little tiny bones in here can't take all of your body weight a sort of thing so wrist guards hip protection butt protection um, I have, oh, I have videos on, uh, wrist guards and hand, uh, gloves and all that. So you can take, delve into that. If you want to look into that kind of gear, I have videos on foot protection and I have videos on the chest and pants and all that and the hip. So they sell armored shorts that you can wear under or over your gear and they are padded, big old padded shorts. They also sell on Amazon, these big old plushy turtles that you can tie around your waist and when you fall then you're landing on a big plushy turtle which is so amazing and i totally wanted to do that but i didn't i think that was made for skiers beginning skiers or something like that but yes falling on a big plushy turtle is so much better than hitting your hips um uh, like uh, on pavement right all right, so gear up, uh, knee guards, the Liat knee guards, I love those. Still use them today and still absolutely top priority. The knee guards are great. Um, when you, at this, at this very early beginning stages, you are very likely to hit your head, your hands, your palms, trying to brace against falls, your hips. And I would say also choose the right foot gear. Um, try try to stay away from sneakers uh boots would be better boots with a stiff sole and high up on the ankles and shin guards oh my gosh i still remember how much my shins kept hitting the pedals because these pedals are just freaking huge and insane and they're heavy and they're like metal and it is my shins were just constantly hitting these i'm not doing that anymore not quite as much but shins and pedals is a huge thing um they they hit in the back and the front and all that stuff but shin guards just those cheapo little shin guards that they use for um soccer players right is that anyways so shin guards would be very helpful. I wish I knew that from the very beginning because that hurts. And, it, and it's repeatedly hitting it over and over again. Okay, so um, you got your gloves, thin, light little gloves. You don't need heavy duty gloves because, you know, all that. But just thin, light little gloves so that when you do fall, you're, you're not tearing up your fingers. Put the wrist guards over the top of them. Um, something light and comfortable uh and uh hip hip protection proper footwear shin guards um i would say that would be the minimum and the minimum but um of course as much gear and protection as you can do for yourself is always the best and most recommended the reason why i'm going light on gear for the very beginning is because you're most likely just doing uh, ground step up maybe kick 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 and try to step up on the other leg and you know so it's mostly like that kind of stuff and when you do get on it's just very slow tootling around right so that's why i'm saying light on gear but the other reason i'm saying light on gear is because i remember oh my gosh i was drenched drenched in sweat after just five minutes on the wheel because 
my body was all of a sudden kicking in on all these little stabilizer muscles that I didn't even knew, know existed. And my body was um, freaking out. My mind was freaking out. And it was overdoing it on all of the muscles because the, my stabilizer muscles weren't doing the job because they didn't know. They're like, whoa, we've been dormant this whole time. And all of a sudden you want us to do what? And then, so it was kicking in my big muscles and saying, okay, well then you do it. And my big muscles were like, what do you want me to do? And this isn't really a job for them, but you know, bless their hearts. They tried. So anyways, drenched in sweat. I needed so many bottles of water. I was just like, "Ah, ah, ah." and I was like, oh my gosh, why is this so hard? All I'm doing is trying to step up onto the pedal. (laughs) I'm not even riding yet. And it's so hard. But, um, and then eventually, you know, the, everything kicks in and then your muscles realize what the, which muscles actually need to be used and um, everything gets a lot more efficient and it builds up those muscles and then, you know, everything goes fine and all that. But yeah, at the beginning, it was bizarre. It was like the weirdest phenomenon that happened. Um, Okay, so you got your wheel, you got it all padded up, you padded yourself all up, and now you're ready to ride. Um, A lot of people will say, Empty parking lots, parks, um, empty parking garages, anywhere where they have lots of wall that you can hang, uh, you know, put your hand on the wall while you go. Um, some people say shopping carts. Shopping cart didn't work for me. Stroller didn't work for me. Um, what my favorite was, was the hallway in my house. And because I had access to both walls and I could just... <laughs> push my way, push my way forward, push my way backwards, push my way forward. And, and I just did that forever. And then, you know, a lot of people go, well, that's not really learning because learning happens when, when you let go and you're not holding on to anything and you're balancing. And I say, that's not true. As much time as you are spending on that wheel, no matter how you're doing it, your body is taking in data and and processing it and putting it into a knowledge base and all of that will kick in and it'll help connect the dots and all that um so yeah i took it slow i took it easy and i did two hands on the hallway thing um i'm just laughing because i remember i did lose control of the wheel several times and i have a few gouges in my um, fake hardwood floor and I do have a hole in my wall where the wheel like I fell and the wheel spun and that big heavy pedal I just showed you like smacked into the wall and left this huge hole so that's the downside of doing it in the house Um, but it's just stuff Uh, so um, let's see, strollers, um, shopping carts, those didn't work for me, but you know, it might help for someone else. Having a person, a real nice patient person would probably have been the best, but I didn't have that. So if you don't have it, don't feel bad. You know, you, you can still do it without, but I think that would have been amazing. Um, I learned on my own and that was hard just because it seemed like there was nothing in in my whole entire life that could help with this. I was so lost. I was like completely baffled on how I was going to ever be able to learn how to balance on this thing. It just nothing, none of my experiences in the past seemed to help at all. And I was very, very frustrated with that. But it turns out that um, with EUCs, it's a lot of intrinsic learning, not extrinsic. And that is why I think that I can just give you these tips sitting here in my wheel room and not on the wheel. 
um, because I can focus on some of the imagery that helped my brain connect the dots. And that is what intrinsic learning is, is it's intrinsically in your body, naturally in your body and mind that makes these connections. And that is, it's just like catching a ball. You don't need to have someone tell you, lift your arm, eyes on the ball, open your hand up reach out, grab the ball, close your fingers around the ball and come back, right? You don't need to think about all of those things. Someone just needs to toss you a ball. And first time you're like, all right, but then they just keep tossing the ball and you intrinsically learn how to catch the ball until now you don't need to even see the ball. You know, you don't need to look at the ball specifically to catch it. You can catch it like this. You can catch it like this. You can now juggle balls and multiple balls all up in the air at one time and you can do it. You know, it's like all of those are intrinsic. And how do you do intrinsic learning? Just with time, spending time with the wheel, just sitting or scootering or standing on the pedals and holding on to both walls and just balancing back and forth, all of that will sink in. And a lot of times I'll find that um, during a day or a session, I hit a brick wall. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just go to sleep that night. That night when you sleep, your body and mind is going to start connecting the dots and putting things together. Come back fresh the next day and there might be improvement or there might not be, but don't worry about it because (laughs) overall there is going to be improvement. It's just all intrinsic. So for me, it takes me longer to learn things than other people because I learn in a very different way than most people do, but it's not a problem because I know from experience, this is always how I learn things and it will happen, it will come. So, um, what we cover, you got your wheel, you got your gear, um, parking lots, okay, location on where you wanna learn at. And so now, uh, how did it finally connect for me to be able to balance on the wheel? And it was bizarre. It, um, I find some people will say, I don't remember all the different imagery things that people have said, but look into images that people had to help them out. For me, it was, I'm on a motorcycle. So literally I would bend my knees, get my arms out like this, and I'd actually go vroom, vroom to go. And, um, that was what it needed, what I needed to click between balance and unicycle oh my gosh it is the weirdest thing because i was like this whole time because i've never done any board sports or any balance things i thought you know and i was getting so frustrated with the unicycle i was starting to believe that i just couldn't get it like i don't know how to balance on there's nothing in me that knows how to balance on it and then when i did this image of I'm on my motorcycle, I got two wheels, I got my handlebars, you know, it was a vroom vroom, and then I could go. And it was like, that was that missing piece to connect those two. And once it connected, that it's the same balance as I'm doing on my motorcycle, um, then things started to (laughs) roll. (laughs) Okay, I'm stupid, sorry. And then I thought that was the funniest thing. Um, okay, so um, not everyone has motorcycle experience. It doesn't matter. It's the same as a bicycle. So imagine that you're on your bicycle and bend your knees, get your arms out, embrace this image, kick off, and just balance. That easy. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know, then try different imageries that might help you with that. Um, obviously, this is for the people that struggled with it, like I did, and not the people that jumps on it and in an hour they're like 
doing 20 mile an hour laps around the parking lot, jumping off curves and everything and all that, right? The super talented people that is obviously opposite of me. But um, okay, so for mounting, for free mounting, uh, I could mount while I'm holding on to something, but I couldn't free mount for the longest time. And it turns out that it was a huge part of it was completely psychological. And I didn't want to tell anybody because I felt stupid. But I'm going to tell you now, because since then, other people have come up to me and told me that it might not be so uncommon. So I'm just going to mention it because probably no one else will in public. Um, except me, I have no shame. Everyone already knows how dumb I am, so um, I openly admit it. So, for free mounting, uh, the standard advice is going to be put your dominant foot onto the pedal, push the wheel up against that leg to hold it steady, so you're going to put a little bit of uh, weight on there to hold that wheel against your leg steady and then kick off and step on. Um, that kick off and step on part is where I was like, everything falls apart, right? And so the imagery that I use to help me with that is because I'm 5'4", I'm short, a lot of times I need to reach up to grab something off of the upper shelf of a cabinet, but then I still can't reach. So what I have to do is I step onto something else only with one leg. And I just step onto that and I reach up and I grab it and I come right back down. In that moment, I am balancing on one leg with an upward and forwards motion. That was the image that I needed to free mount. So I had stepped on, I had my weight onto here and what I needed to do was push off, go up and forward, reach, and get my other foot onto the pedal. And that was the, I don't know, something about that motion, the up and forward motion. And I would even reach with my hand, pretending like I'm reaching up and grabbing something. Because somehow that imagery made was connecting the dots of my body to not just flop over on one side or the other side. My body was understanding that, no, you need to have this upward, forward, and balance on one leg, reach up and put the foot down on the other pedal sort of thing. Um, many people have told me multiple times that one-legged one -legged riding helps with the mounting. So spend time one-legged on the wheel, one legged, pushing off, adding as much delay as you can before you put the other leg on, uh, other foot onto the pedal, right? Things like that. Um, but then even after all of that, I still had problems mounting. And uh, so what I did was I used a hiking stick. And everybody made fun of me for the hiking stick. But um, what I didn't share with people is that the hiking stick was like 80% psychological. So the thing was I could mount when I was completely alone. When I couldn't mount was when I felt like people were looking at me because I have huge social anxiety issues. Um, so, so, um, let's see, physically it did help to have the, the hiking stick that I use was a collapsible one that telescope collapses versus the ones that fold. It doesn't really matter. It's just that the telescoping one is easy to adjust the height of. So at first I had it at a comfortable height and it's touching the ground, and I actually physically used it to help stab stabilize me enough for me to get the other foot onto the pedal, and then it was great, and um, it was fine. And then, um, then I was able to shorten it so that it didn't even touch the ground, but I was holding it, and that gave me comfort. And then eventually it made it so... Um, I didn't need to extend it at all 
I'd had it at its shortest setting. Then I changed to just a selfie stick without the phone attachment. So it was just a stick, but I just used that because it collapsed to a much smaller size and I, all I needed was to hold it. And then I had it in my hip bag, but I didn't actually have to take it out, but I knew it was there so that, you know, I, I could tell myself if I start having problems, I know it's there. I can take it right out and it's right here for me. Um, and then all of a sudden one day I didn't need to even pack my, my stick anymore. So what was going on is that I actually have zero self confidence and I get super, super anxious around social situations and people and intersections when I know that I'm standing there being different at an intersection and everyone in all the cars around me um, are looking at me and they want me to fail and it's like it just gets overwhelming in my head and um, uh, so I need a talisman I need something to comfort and I, and I need a focus so when I start getting so anxious and having all of this, then, um, then I can force myself to turn that, try to block it out, turn it, and then focus on this thing that I'm physically holding in my hand, which is what, and my social anxiety is such a thing. I mean, this mirrored visor, that's what the mirrored visor is actually for is because I don't want people to see me. <laughs> um, that's why I have my helmet on all the time and stuff like that. So I have this thing about, so because I have no self-confidence, uh, things that help me is that I can put confidence into other things. That's why all of my wheels have names. Jamie Lannister, because I'm always alone. You know, I learn alone. I, I'm doing this all alone and stuff. So, and then I don't have any confidence in myself, but I need to have confidence. I need to have faith and trust in something to be able to do this, right? So, so I name my wheels. And this is Jamie Lannister and he's my friend and he doesn't laugh at me and he'll take care of me and he'll look out for me and he'll keep me safe. And that is what I need. And then that is what the stick was. It's my talisman. Okay, everything's going to be okay because I have my stick. And then eventually I weaned myself off of it and then, you know, I didn't need it anymore. So um, the stick is not common. I haven't heard of anyone else really using a stick. And lots of people gave me shit about it. And lots of people made fun of me about it and stuff like that. But it's what I needed to do to cope. And then... I found out that, um, so other people came up to me and told me this, some people hold a water bottle in their hand and that water bottle is the same exact thing to them as my stick was to me. It's just that the water bottle is more discreet, e much easier to explain away. So they didn't need a physical thing to help them mount but they needed a psychological thing. Or it could be that the extra, just the extra little weight of having the water bottle um, helped them with a count, as a counterweight as they mounted. So you can try that. Maybe try holding a little something as a counterweight um, to help you mount. Or if you need a little talisman like I did, maybe that's a thing too. The hiking stick was for me. Um, but yeah, really, it was the social anxiety issue and the, and the intersection and the pressure at an intersection and stuff like that. Those were things that the psychological thing is what gets me all the time. It's like my biggest enemy is my own self and my brain sort of thing. Um, but this is why I do these things to try and get myself over it, trying different ways to 
Anyways, how do we learn how to ride a unicycle? Okay, so now we know how to mount, right? You got different imagery, you have different items that might help you out. Um, and then it's just time and practice, time and practice. Um, practice with the one-legged thing, practice with the, with the delaying your foot to get on there and trying to delay it longer and longer until, you know, you can do one-legged. Um, I mean, strive to do one-legged riding because that can only help you with your balance and do it with both legs. Um, uh, that also becomes really helpful when you're riding a lot of dirt and single track and a lot of places might not let you be on your dominant leg and you might need to mount on your off leg sometimes because you're in a tricky spot, you know, or whatever. So those um, are skills that are really handy later on and all that good stuff. Um, okay, so you know how to balance now. You know how to free mount. Um, when you start going, you might experience some little wobbles. Um, if your wheel is fine, which most likely it is, most likely these little wobbles are just little, it's the wheel's response to little imbalances. So you might feel that after a bump, you get little wobbles. Or if you try to go too fast, like right now you've been riding at five miles an hour, all of a sudden you try to ride at 15 miles an hour and then you start getting wobbles at 15 miles an hour. It's because there's a little bit of imbalance. Slow down, back off and let your body build, build your foundation. So with, um, when I was racing motorcycles, my race team name was actually Smooth Curves Racing. So that was my thing. And it was a, you know, play on words and all that. But um, it was also really important that I've always worked on smoothness and have speed be a byproduct never chase speed you chase speed then it doesn't come anyways and that's how I get in trouble by trying to chase speed instead I work on foundation and smoothness and you know all those things and then speed always came all speed always came as a byproduct um, so when I was training with motorcycle racing and I want to beat my best lap times and I'm, you know, I've always found that every time I've beat my best lap times is, are those days when I was well rested and I felt good about myself and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to take it easy today. And then I get out on the track and I'm going around and I'm going around and then I start getting lost in my music, getting lost in the feel of the flow and the sway. And then I get into a zone and it just, everything just feels perfect in this moment. And then I get off the track, I check my lap times and oh my gosh, I beat my personal best by miles or seconds, whatever, right? I, and it always came effortlessly. Every single time I've been all like, today's the day I'm going to beat my personal, you know, I'm going to like, da -da 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 -da. and I came out with this kind of energy and I got on the track and I was like, bah, 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 bah. my times always sucked. I felt scared. I felt rushed. I felt pressured. I felt like I was really pushing it. I was really trying to grab it and hold it. I was really trying to get it and it never worked out. And, um, and yeah, and this whole thing actually applies to a lot of other stuff in life. But anyways, um, so we're learning. We want to go fast. You get the wobbles. Stop doing what you're doing. If you're trying to speed, back off. If you're getting the wobbles when you're braking, stop braking. Try to do some carves instead or... Um, or uh, push the wheel up against one leg or the other leg, um, something like that, um, and work on the foundation again. It will come. Okay, so you are improving on, oh, we're kind of running out of time. 
There are other tips to be had. Let's see, taking a turn. Um, no, that's more advanced. All right, but we're learning. This is everything that you need to know to learn, right? I've covered, I've, it's, it's intrinsic, it's easy. Just put in the time on the pedals and to some it just comes naturally to others it's a big struggle but um, that's really it I can't really show you stuff on the wheel because it's stuff that your body needs to figure out on its own and the only thing that'll do that is time on the pedal so uh, pedals so anyways um, okay that's it for now. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hope that was helpful. If there's anything else you want me to talk about, any other topics, um, please let me know and I will try to accommodate. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Yay, did it. <laughs> and um, I will see you guys next time. Thank you. Bye.